That's the false dichotomy. Believing just because you fail, there's nothing after this. Mm -hmm. And I am such living proof that there is. And that's what this painting really represents is the subsequent lives I have lived after I had initially failed. Hello and welcome to another wonderful podcast conversation of the Epic Kate Show. I'm really, really happy to introduce Jared to the channel and to be getting to know him. There is a trigger warning here. There is a lot of talk about um, drugs, underage drinking, um, abuse, violation. Don't let that scare you off. It is a hopeful conversation about learning to accept failure, learning how to trust yourself again after go going through things, overcoming the fear of death, and taking control of your life, choosing the life that you want to live. I know that it's going to be powerful for somebody out there. Jared's story involves a fascinating near-death experience. Let's get into it. You are such a fascinating person. Like we've talked a few times and I just want to be your best friend and just hear all your stories and just be around that energy. Like you've, you've overcome so much and have so many stories to tell. So I was thinking maybe a good place to just kind of jump into your story is that you were a self-proclaimed crazy kid with an unstable life. So I was a latchkey kid, which is basically, you know, I was raised by a single mother who was away quite often, you know, trying to make a, a stable living for her two kids, uh, me and my brother. And uh, because of that, that lack of supervision, um, my brother was very focused on like, I'm going to be the good kid. I'm going to do what I'm told. I'm going to play by the rules. And for me, I was kind of like, I'm going to see what I can get away with. And uh, I just, but like, I didn't have enough of a direction to be like truly diabolical I was just kind of chaotic I would I don't know I would ride my bike into trees just to see what would happen with my friends um I don't know like this is the thing <laughs> is it's kind of like um we just we wanted to see like what we could get away with so we would do all sorts of crazy stuff I would I would run away for like a day and a half but like no one was home so it's not like anyone would notice like what does it matter if I you know spent the whole night just like walking around somewhere, you know, in the city. No one, no one was even there to stop me. So it was very, it, um, it just kind of started out like that. Things got a little bit like darker in my high school years. Uh, that was when I think um, a lot of it was like, I think any gay person can, um, can identify with that fact that like you become very alternative and strange in high school because you're, you're figuring out who you are, you know you're different, you know you're weird. And for me, I had to find an outward expression of that. And at the time, goth was just kind of there. It was a thing. So I became very goth. Um, and I think a lot of people associate goth with um, like Satan worship and drug use and whatever else, you know. But I, I didn't really have the desire to be a drug addict. You know, <laughs> like that was never something in me. But I mean, that didn't stop me from doing a lot of drugs. Uh, so... When I was a uh, sophomore in high school, I was like 14. Um, I was living in Montana at the time and life in Montana, coming from California to Montana, it's just like, wow, this is really boring. There's nothing going on. I really hate this. So I started, I just instantly found myself connecting with some of the stranger people in school. And I would I would really only spend time with like anyone who was just super absurd. And I didn't really care about anyone else. Um, but a lot of these people were struggling with drug issues, struggling with whatever else. Um, so I kind of just became a part of that world. And I wound up selling a lot of drugs. And um, I would come to school and like, I was kind of the bodega for vice, you know, um, a friend of mine, we would uh, go to the adult store and we would steal porn DVDs. And then, you know, I had a friend who would buy me cigarettes and I didn't smoke. I just sold cigarettes. So I became kind of this vending machine of anything someone wanted. And uh, because of that, I kind of knew everyone's poison. I knew who smoked. I knew who, like, who liked incest porn, who, you know, who liked to do Molly. And, um, you know, I'd sell cold medicine, you know, and it was just what it, that I know. 
I know. But um, I was good at it. I wound up taking photography in school so I could steal chemicals from the photo lab. And uh, yeah, it, it became like a really serious thing. <laughs> And um, I got really deep into um, selling drugs. And uh, a lot of my friends wound up getting hurt in some way. Uh, there was just a lot of bad stuff that was going on that year of my life. And uh, I was also going through like, I was processing a lot of sexual abuse that I had experienced early in my life. So I, um, I just had, a, I was a really unstable person. Um, I wound up getting kicked out of school because there was this kid who was bothering me and I, I stabbed him in the hand with a pencil. And like, I, it was one of those things, everyone in the class is kind of like, well, that's what you did, guy. You know, like you kept bothering Jared, of course he's gonna stab you in the hand, but I still was the one who stabbed him in the hand. So, you know, and I, I take credit for that. Um, so it made sense that I got kicked out of school, but like at the time my mom was going through a lot and like, she just really couldn't focus on the kitty. She's talking about focus, um, but you know, she was going through a lot and she couldn't really focus on the trouble that I was going through. So she would just send me to some Christian therapist who, um, you know, really wasn't interested in what I was going through. He just wanted to know if like, I was going to accept Jesus as my Lord and savior, but that had nothing to do with what was going on in my life. Um, so it was just a, a really crazy time. I'm really grateful that we wound up moving away a year later because I think I would have gotten really deep into it. And some of the people I left behind when I came back for Bible college, I wound up moving back to that same town for Bible college three years later. They were in a really bad way. And they were using lines that like I used on them, you know, um, about how drug use is like glamorous and wonderful and all this other stuff. And I was like, no, Jesus is cool. You know, like complete 180. Yeah. Um, this guy, Andy, I used to pick on him a lot for being kind of a Jesus freak. When he saw me walk in to Bible college, he thought I was there to like detonate explosives. He was like, what the hell? You know, really freaked out by just seeing me. Um, but, you know, I apologized to him and I said, you know, I'm really sorry. Um, and I hope that we can be cool. And, um, he wound up being my friend throughout Bible college and I wound up making some really, really great friends. But this is what you mentioned earlier, um, because my life was so unstable, like I wound up paying for Bible college with the money that I made while selling drugs, which I think is really crazy. I really thought that becoming a Christian would put a bow on all of the chaos and damage. And, you know, I really thought Jesus would heal me. I, that's kind of how he's marketed, you know, like Jesus can heal all wounds and he can, you know, being a Christian means that all your problems are kind of solved. You can just look to him and all your pain and suffering, kind of that's your answer. That's your resolution. Mm -hmm. You don't need to keep thinking about this. The it's, it's all taken care of now. You're a Christian, no more problems. You know, you know how that is, Katie. Oh yeah. Yeah. Would you Once say you become a Christian, there's never any problems, right? Never. Never. Uh, so it sounds like such a, dichotomy that you had this crazy life exposed to so much but you still said that you were raised to be naive do you think that the naivety was that being a christian makes everything la di da yeah you know it was just kind of like i was i was the younger kid and i think there was a lot of things going on amongst you know the adults in my life and my older brother you know all the older people in my life that were really like shameful or um, I shouldn't say shameful, but a lot of the older people in my life felt ashamed of the trouble that was going on in their lives. So they would kind of put a veil over me. They would say, you know, oh, nothing's wrong, Jared. You know, this guy just, you know, he's screaming at me about car keys because he's just sad and tired, you know, or like whatever it was. And um, there'd always be these like random crazy circumstances that made no sense. I didn't know why we moved so much. I didn't know. Um, why so many bizarre things were happening in my life. Uh, because it was explained to me in like a very kind of um, soft, fluffy, plush kind of way. So I grew up with just this massive amount of naivety about um, how the world works mm -hmm. and how, uh, how dangerous things can be. No one ever explained to me how um, walking in front of cars and traffic is probably not a good thing to do. My family just kind of saw it as funny. I think 
they saw me as someone who was potentially very chaotic and dangerous. And um, I kind of just had a, a taste for adventure to a very um, viceful degree. I, I was kind of an adrenaline junkie when I was a kid. And I think they just kind of played it off as a cutesy thing when really it put me in danger a lot. It's like the Cuban Missile Crisis, you know, yes, we're really close to eminent disaster, but at the very last moment, someone's going to make a phone call and everything will be fine. And that's just kind of how I felt about my life. My life was a continuous Cuban Missile Crisis, where I was always on the cusp of absolute destruction, but at the very last moment, everything works out. Um, and I never realized how many times I definitely could have died. Definitely. Even as a little, little kid. And that... Do you, do, do you think that that mindset that you were raised with of not really being aware of danger is what led that terrible thing to happen to you when you were 13? Um, you know, so I can go into that if you'd like. Uh, when as I was- you're, As much as you're comfortable with it, I know it's really hard. I'm, I'm here to answer your questions. So uh, when I was 12, I was about to turn 13. Um, my mom was working at a home for like abused young girls and she was doing a magnificent job and like what she was doing was so great like I am so proud of her because these were girls who were in protection programs and had nobody and they had so much chaos and pain and suffering inside of them and they would be getting held down by staff, you know, trying, you know, whatever's going on because they were just so like violent and chaotic, but then they'd see my mom and they'd just be like, oh, hi, you know, and um, they just loved her. And my mother just walked on water for these girls. And I think she represented um, what it is to get through all of this pain and suffering and what it, like she embodied this feminine perfection for them. And they just, they, in her, they saw hope. And I think, she helped so many girls at this time. Um, and I mean, I, I will never fault her for this, but what I will say is like having a home where it's just me, you know, for days on end, because she would have to be there for two, three days straight. She didn't come home like the whole weekend. Um, and my brother would go out and he hang out with friends. So it was just me. And um, I had a couple of friends who, they, they lived kind of more interesting lives. I was in middle school, but like I looked older, I was, early bloomer I was like the tallest kid in my class and uh one of my friends was like let's hang out with the high schoolers we look like high schoolers let's do this if we just keep our mouth shut no one will know um and he introduced me to like a group of people and one of them his name was Alec and uh I was somebody who I never really had a male role model in my life um especially at that time and I was definitely craving it my dad out of the picture um and this guy was somebody who, like, you would have to be insane not to be, not to want to be this guy. Um, he was so talented. He was so handsome. Um, he just had this charisma about him. And I wish I could explain it, but, like, when you were around him, it's just you felt so understood. You felt so attended to. He just, he had this way of, he sat quietly and he would just listen. Um, and that's really what I remember most about him is that I really felt like he heard everything I said. Um, he, at the time, I know, he never really talked much about himself. He was kind of a mystery. He was a very talented guitarist. Um, he uh, had access to multiple cars. I don't know why, but like every time I saw him, he was driving a different car. Um, lots of kind of mysterious things. He wore dentures. Um, he didn't have like teeth of his own and he was probably like 16 or 17 at the time. So um, something happened. He was really obsessed with uh, this book called like The Tropic of Cancer. If you've heard of that, it's about sexuality. Um, and he was really searching. He was really obsessed with this religion called Zoroastrianism. And he was also really obsessed with um, uh, lucid dreaming and meditation. So me and like a group of my friends and him, there was kind of this ravine um, back behind my school and we built kind of like a fort there and we would just go there and we'd like meditate, talk, and we'd hang out and whatever. And I just really felt like I was learning so much from this guy. And I felt like he really 
was investing in me. Um, I didn't realize at the time that this was kind of part of the scheme that he had. But um, it wasn't until later, I lived in this town called Temecula in California. Temecula, it's, it's um, some Native American language for anthill. That's what it means. And it really is just this cursed anthill in the middle of nowhere. But also right adjacent to Temecula are these beautiful wineries. And um, there's a lot of wines that come from that area. And we would go to that area to party with high school and college kids and whatever, um, almost every weekend. He would pick me up over at my friend's house and we would just have a blast. And it was so much fun. But as time progressed, um, things got a little unusual. And when we were drinking, and I was like 13, I just turned 13, and I was drinking like profusely. And by the time I got to high school, like, I'd be on the bus and I'd have like a bottle of vodka in like a water bottle and I would just be drinking vodka straight from a water bottle like in the back of the bus because I was just I I was really not right and everything in my life became about hiding the fact that like I was constantly drinking to deal with what I was going through and Alec at this party there was one night where this girl was like I want to dress you up in drag and uh and I thought, oh, this would be fun. And I didn't really think much of it. And um, Alec just became like very in awe of how I appeared. Um, he was just like, look like a beautiful woman. And it went from that to us having sex, um, me in drag, not really understanding what was going on. I was really confused. I was really drunk. Um, and I wasn't sure if he knew what had happened or if he understood what was going on either because I mean we were both hammered and it was just kind of whatever but at the same time I was kind of while it was happening I was thinking like I don't mind this you know I Alec is a really handsome guy I would be lucky to be in a relationship with someone like this um he's you know all I could ever dream of when it comes to man so I remember one day we were sitting on the top of this hill and we were talking about um, Zoroastrianism, which is all he ever really talked about. Um, and I just asked him like if I could kiss him. And he was like repulsed by that. Um, and was just kind of like, why the hell would you want to kiss me? Um, and that's when I realized like something was a little off because even after that, like things continued to happen. And it wasn't until one of my friends, Alex, pulled me aside and said, you know, what he's doing is okay, Jared. Um, and at the time I was really upset and was just like, you're just jealous. You're mad that he favors me. Um, and Alex kind of said, you know, he's been doing it to a number of guys. Um, it's not just you. And we got in this huge fight, but Alex was also like the sole connection between me and Alex. So once I got in a fight with Alex, I didn't see Alex anymore. And, um, yeah, it was it was a really tough time because like I missed him. Um, and the way that he the way that our connection worked, me and him, um, was I I felt so deeply connected to him. Like there were times when I could have sworn he could like read my mind, which isn't um you talk to a lot of people who have been sexually abused and they believe things like that. And I believed that for years. I really thought he knew what I was thinking. Um, I thought even though I haven't seen him for years, he's still just, you know, taking inventory of my thoughts. Um, so it was, it was a really, it was a very painful time when I was a teenager and I was going through a lot. I was processing a lot and I was just a really strange guy. We, we, we went into your teenage years yeah. and all the, the drug craziness of that. Yeah. Where were you mentally and spiritually when you were 21, 22 and the next huge thing happened in your life? Yeah. So a lot had happened since then. So um, in short, there was a time where I was living in Michigan. Um, I joined a band named Crocus. And at the time living there, a lot of bands were coming out of Denver. So we decided to move to Denver. And uh, we were trying to make it as musicians and things just weren't 
going well. Uh, a lot of people really loved the music that we were making, but then whenever we kind of would approach something that would lead to success, it wound up causing a problem. We had a manager who was stealing money from us and it was just a, it was a really rough time. Um, <clears throat> some of my bandmates like were struggling with drugs and um, I actually just lost one of them recently. So it, it was, uh, it was like a really rough time for all of us. Um, and then towards the end of it, I started getting really sick and um, it was probably like two years into living in Denver. One day I was on stage and I was performing and uh, I like fainted on stage, but like no one noticed. Like I came to and like my hand on the mic stand was holding me up and I just popped back up and I sang the third verse of one of our songs and then finished the song. And I, I was, you know, I had a lot of energy and intensity on stage and I was like, I'm bringing it no matter what. So, um, but that kind of showed me that I, I need to take this serious, whatever's wrong with me, like I actually have to figure it out. So I contacted my family, I told my mom about it and she just said, you know, if you really think that you're dying, which is what I told her, like, I'm pretty sure I'm dying. I had to walk with a cane at the time. Like I, I really wasn't doing well. Um, she was like, if you really think you're dying, you need to come back home and you need to be with us. Um, so that we can figure out what's going on. I didn't have any health care. So they were like, you know, we'll, we'll pay for a doctor here. And um, while I was there, everything kind of blew up with my family and it, it wasn't going well, but um, I wound up getting like a rash on my foot that spread all the way up to like my hips. And the whole lower half of my body was just covered in like these little pock marks. And I was really freaked out by it. So I actually, I went to Planned Parenthood, uh, not just abortions, by the way, just gonna throw that out there. Planned Parenthood saves lives, they saved mine. Um, yes, uh, I went there and they tested me for STDs and they said, you know, uh, at the time I thought I had Addison's disease. Um, one of the doctors was telling me like, we're probably gonna have to put a pacemaker in. Um, so that was kind of concerning, but they said, you know, well, we have good news, we have bad news. Um, the marks on your body, uh, that is just athlete's foot that has gotten out of control um, and it's spread halfway up your body. And the reason is, is because you are severely immunocompromised because you are HIV positive. And uh, I started crying, but I started crying not because I was like sad or scared. I was honestly like deeply relieved um, because I knew I knew a couple of things. Um, back when I was in high school, Alec called me out of the blue and he had said like, hey, I want you to know I had slept with this girl and she was HIV positive. And I went and got tested and I told myself if I'm positive um, or if I'm negative, I'm gonna dedicate my life to God. And um, I said, well, what happened? And there was this really long, weird pause. And he kind of just, spouted out after a while well i'm negative so i dedicated my life to god i just wanted to know that i came up and i didn't realize at the time that was him telling me or trying to tell me like hey get tested you know um but he chickened out so i went on for years and years and years not knowing the reason i've been so sick throughout my teenage years and uh you know had to deal with so much was because i was HIV positive um thankfully i you know turned to Christian in my later years, so I was never sexually active, um, which allowed me to not spread, you know, HIV, which is really good. I'm very grateful. Thank you, Jesus, for that, um, because I would have had a really hard time living with myself if I would have known. Um, but yeah, I, I found out I was HIV positive, which meant for me that well, I don't have Addison's disease. Um, I can take a medication and I will live because Addison's disease, if you have that, you don't live very long. Um, so I just kind of felt like, okay, yeah, this is a life-threatening illness, but this is something that can be managed and I can live a normal life. I just need to go on medication. Um, the issue with that was is that uh, I had been positive for 11 years at that point without knowing. Um, and the longest you can go without taking medication after seroconverting, which is when you get HIV, 
is 11 years. Like that is the longest that like, has ever been recorded. So it's a miracle at this point because the chances were completely slim that um, I would still be alive. I should have been hospitalized. I should have, you know, and I have been hospitalized, but I didn't know for what. Um, but uh, it was amazing I was still alive, like absolute miracle. But at that point, my immune system was so weak, I wasn't allowed around animals or plants. Um, I was on a series of antibiotics. And at that point, um, I was just incredibly ill. Uh, at that point, I was in a relationship. Um, it wasn't a very good one, but um, he was kind enough. I was living at, in my car when I met him. And he was kind enough to let me live with him. Um, and I was very, very sick, but like I started taking the medication and it was Atripla, which um, anyone who's familiar with HIV medication, uh, Atripla, they call it the Atrip because it's Tripla. It's three medications and one of them is a hallucinogen. Um, at the time that it was created, beggars couldn't be choosers. You know, um, there is, there's a whole history behind uh, HIV medications and how people would protest to have these medications released before they were necessarily ready and fully researched and approved the FDA because it's like, well, we're dying. We need them now, you know, which is a very fair argument. But at the same time, um, the intensity of the side effects were questionable. So um, I was getting like bleeding ulcers in my stomach. I was hallucinating all day. And um, it was it was like a really wild time in my life that I don't remember very well. Yeah, I was in this relationship and I was slowly recovering and trying to get my bearings back, but just kind of out of my mind, and hallucinating constantly and dealing with the fact that like I had been sexually abused, dealing with all of the crazy things that I had done when I was younger. Um, I, I was just really at a point in my life where I was trying to get my feet back on the ground, but it's hard when you literally cannot sense which way is up because you're so busy tripping balls on this medication that makes you hallucinate. But it's either that or die. So, you know, it's kind of like, well, was I guess it, I'll take the, go ahead. Was it like hard to know if like, is that, is that really a, a purple blob monster talking to me? Is that really there? Like was... So when I say hallucinations, it's not that I would perceive things that weren't there. It's that I, the way I would perceive things change. So like when I would look at a chair, it wasn't just a chair. When I look at an orange, it wasn't just an orange. Um, it, it was like this orange means something. And this orange, because I'm holding this orange, I know that I need to watch Breaking Bad tonight. I don't know. Like it was always really random, strange things. But um, the way your mind works and understands and comprehends things, there's there's always a deeper meaning to everything. So I was reading into kind of everything. kind of a beautiful mind effect. Yeah, um, where it's 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 uh it's good and bad in some ways. Part of me misses it because I was very creative at the time. I could. I was constantly wanting to paint. I was constantly wanting to create things because I had so many ideas um, because my mind was connecting all these strange concepts together in ways that I don't think anyone normally would. Uh, so I felt very lucky that I had that kind of creative spirit inside of me and I could use it. But at the same time, it was making it, I couldn't hold a job. I couldn't, I couldn't really do anything because I was so out of my mind. I was just such a strange mentally unwell person and I would try to do things and I just couldn't really focus or like you know I'd get hired to like wire a building which is something I did robotics and mechanical stuff. anyways so like I knew about like wiring and like electrical work but like I would try to do it but then I would just like braid all the wires together and make like a you know a mandala or something yeah you know like whatever and it's like no I'm supposed to be wiring the building and like connecting it to outlets but instead I'm like making art so it just it never really worked because I was just so out of my mind and I was so sick still at the time my body had not recovered so and it took a long time it took about like a year a year and a half for me to so kind of get it, my bearings so was it after years of being on this medication and being so sick that you had your near-death experience oh so during that time 
while I was sick, there were nights where I would stop meeting. And uh, who I was with Nick, who I was with at the time, he would like shake me awake or like, you know, try to like kind of compress my stomach. And I wake up and be like, what the hell are you doing? Because I didn't know what was going on. I just wake up and there's this guy on top of me, like, you know, pushing my chest. I'm like, what are you doing? What's going on? Why are you acting so crazy? And he'd cry and he'd just be like, nothing, everything's fine. You know, and I was just like, this man's insane, you know? <laughs> but um, it wasn't until like the morning he'd be like, yeah, you kind of stopped breathing last night. And, you know, it just, it was what it was. Um, so it was honestly a very frequent thing. And like, at the time, I, one of the side effects of atrip was very vivid dreams. And um, I would have like sleep paralysis, you know, and I, when you have that, you like hallucinate things and I'd always see certain things. And um, there was one particular dream that was incredibly vivid. And I was sitting in my mother's bedroom from back when I was a kid. And outside of the window wasn't the typical view. We had like a view of like this park outside of our window but um in this dream behind me was sorry night but it was red everything was red and it was moving and it was alive and it was kind of like dimensional and um i just kind of stared at it and i marveled and then um someone came in uh one of my friends at the time came into the room and he sat down on my mom's bed and started talking to me very calm and was just saying, you know, this is really beautiful, right? Like, this is a very beautiful thing to see. And I agreed. And he said, you know, you can stay here forever if you'd like. And um, that kind of hit a note for me. I understood what he was talking about. And I understood right in that moment, like, I'm dreaming. Um, but something that, like, Alec and I discussed back when we would talk about meditation and all this stuff was that there's kind of a waking life and then there's a lucid life. And this lucid life is the life that we live when we're dreaming. And the lucid life is kind of practice for the afterlife. And it's kind of like every night we experience a mini death and we walk around in the afterlife, just kind of trying to get our bearings because it's so different and so strange. And, um, you know, the more we're able to control ourselves in our lucid life, the better off we'll be once we reach that life full time. Um, so there was this belief that I had that what it meant to dream forever was to die. I mean, that's what dreaming was, according to what Alec and I had discussed, was it was just practice for the eternal afterlife, which is a dream. Um, so I knew when he said, you can stay here forever, he was saying, you can just die. If you want to, you can just die. And you will be in that painting and you will be there and it's beautiful and you'll be happy. And I so vehemently opposed and was just like, no, I can't do that. Like, I want to live my life. Like, and he kind of had a, a very strong argument. He's like, well, you, what are you going to do? Like, you know, you live in some guy's like crappy trailer house and like, you can't keep a job and you have nothing in your name. Like you just, you have nothing. You're nothing. Everything you had, you lost, you know, you were in a band, you had a family, you had all these things. They're all gone, you know? What do you have that's worth living for? And I just didn't care. Like, I didn't have an answer, but I was just like, that doesn't matter to me. I just want to be alive. Like, I want to be alive to be alive. That's enough for me. Um, and that's when he got, like, upset in my dream. And he was just like, you know, I can come and I can bring you back here anytime. When you're awake, when you're watching TV, when you're cleaning the house, I can come and I can bring you here against your will. I can drag you into that painting if I want to. Um, and that was terrifying because what I understood, you know, very clearly what he was saying was you can die at any time and there's nothing you can do about it. You don't have control over that. You have no say in when I come and I drag you into the afterlife. Um, and yeah, I mean, I honestly don't know if that was one of the nights where I stopped breathing, there were so many. Um, I don't know if that was one of the nights where, I don't know, so many things went wrong at that point in my life, but um, it really shook me. It really made me think about why I want to be alive. Um, and that image, the starry night, I'd see it and I just, would always feel really uncomfortable around it. 
Um, and I know like it has nothing to do with life and mortality, you know, like the image of the starry night is something that was painted by Van Gogh way before I was alive. It should have nothing to do with it. You know what I mean? But I felt this like really deep personal connection with it. And I hated it. Like it was the one painting that I just I couldn't look at, which sucks because it's also one of the most iconic paintings of all time. And you see it everywhere. So I would constantly see it and be made uncomfortable, you know? Um, and it was, it was a hard thing to deal with for a really long time in my life. So, yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, there's a lot between that and now and me sitting in a room where I have it framed and I photoshopped myself to turn it red. Um, but that's the part that like, honestly, I have a really hard time um, etching out the path that went from that dream to me having this in my home and feeling this kind of comfort every time I see it. Uh, you know, because now this is, this is my living room, you know, and uh, every time I come home, I walk upstairs, I see this and I'm just like, oh, I'm home. Like, I'm never quite sure I'm home until I see this. Like, I know that sounds weird, but like, just the, like a week ago, I like rearranged the shelves in my fridge and I came downstairs like really late at night and I had forgotten that I had rearranged the shelves and I opened my fridge and my first thought was like, oh my God, am I in someone else's house? Like, where am I? Where? And I had to like look around and I saw this painting and I'm like, okay, I know I'm in my house. And that like calmed me down. But you know, like sleepy people, it takes a moment for things to kind of sink in. So yeah, it wasn't until I saw the picture that I was like, oh wait, yes, I just rearranged my fridge. That's what's going on don't yeah. even though it was with terror that this this threat came it it seems like it still gave you this clarity of I'm here for a reason I choose to be here so so how did how did how did that change over come is that clear <laughs> no it is and you know it's really universal isn't it this idea that like when we are confronted with the idea that we're gonna die I mean, it's, it's, you should feel terror when you really understand that like, I'm gonna die, you're gonna die, we're all gonna die. And it can come for us at any time. It doesn't matter how profoundly it's spoken to you. For me, it was this weird dream persona that was very threatening, but that dream persona who's very threatening, really, he's speaking to all of us. Like, it's true for all of us. At, any point in any day we could just boom an airplane could fall out of the sky and land right on our head meteorite whatever it is heart attack you know it there's the list is endless we could come up with a million ways to die final destination style and there's no way we can wiggle our way out of it there's we can try to prepare we can pad our lives you know whatever and try to make ourselves feel safe but it's a lie you know like if death is gonna come for us, death is gonna come for us and we can't get away. And I think a lot of us spend a lot of our lives fooling ourselves thinking like, well, if I just use crosswalks and you know, like do this and have my vitamins, like I'll be okay. But that's not how death works. Like that's not at all. I think it's weird looking at something to me that symbolizes my mortality, that symbolizes death. But if you really think about it, like, is life about death or is death about life? You know what I mean? Like, this is red, but like, red doesn't symbolize death. It symbolizes life because that's the color of blood. You know, that's the color of mortality, of vivaciousness. It's my favorite color. Um, so when I look at this, I look at kind of like the life that I have in my hands right now. I think about, um, there was, there was, I overheard like a group of people talking and it was about somebody who was basically saying like, I'm contemplating suicide. And one of the other people talking was like, well, you should do it, but not do it. And what they meant by that was that like, you can give up your life. You can, you can end your life but you can walk away from it and start another one. You can abandon everything. And I think there's a lot of people who feel really trapped 
and feel like they can't escape. And that's why they're contemplating suicide. And what they don't realize is that like, if you feel trapped in the life you're living, get out of it. Like you can do it. And I've done it so many times. When I left my band, I didn't tell anyone. Like I, I wasn't really planning on it, but I mean, like when I went to California, I didn't really tell anyone why I was going. I was just like, I'm visiting my family. I didn't tell them like, oh, I think I'm dying. And I need to go there to like see what's happening. You know, there's this, there's this thing where you connect failure with it being over. You know, I failed, it's all over. And I think that's the false dichotomy. Believing just because you failed, there's nothing after this. Mm. And I am such living proof that there is. And that's what this painting really represents is the subsequent lives I have lived after I had initially failed. Because all I can say about that, like if I know anything, it's that life after failure is a dramatic improvement to the life that existed before that. Um, so I mean, if you ever feel trapped, like walk, just get the fuck out, you know? Like, even if it costs you everything, if you have to live in your car, I've done it. If you have to move back in with your parents, I've done it. If you wanna die, walking away, try it. You know, if you have nothing to lose, I mean like, hell, if you wanna kill yourself tomorrow, fine. Today, how about you walk away from your life and you try something entirely new? Just take on a new identity. Tell everyone your name is Barbara and that you're from New Zealand and that you're a paleontologist and see what it does for you. It's interesting because people always say, no matter where you go, there you are. Like, you know, your problems will never escape you because they're inside of you. But I, I, call, I call bullshit because I have done this so many times where I literally on a whim, I moved to Madison, Wisconsin because my car broke down there when I was 18. And 10 years later on a whim, I was going through kind of a divorce that was breaking the engagement. And I was just like, I need to get out of here. I need to stop all this. I go there on a whim, my life entirely new. I was an entirely new person. And honestly, it fixed a lot of the troubles in my life. Yeah, I was still me. I was still stupid in the same ways I was stupid before, but a new person was making these stupid problems. You know, like I was, <laughs> a new person was making these weird bad decisions. And it was with a whole new cast and crew. I had a whole new fresh start. And I think, I was able to learn going through it all again, how to do it better this time. And my life was so much better. Um, I, I think we spend so much of our lives trying to control everything and it's such a waste of our times. We, we gotta let go, we gotta walk because once we accept the failure, we're free. And that's when really everything begins, failure is really just an essential step in the creative process. And it's just one little hiccup in what is altogether this amazing continuous journey. So if you feel like you're trapped, if, you're, if you feel like you're in a dead end, just know what this means is that you need to kill something in your life, not yourself. You need to kill something in your life so that you can get out of this trap and that you can move on and you can keep going. And if you don't feel like moving on if you don't feel like going that means you really need to move on and you really need to keep going and that's the lesson i really learned i feel like there are so many times in my life where i felt like i was caving in on myself i felt like i had lost it all um romantically you know personally in my life so what's your reason for living now you know what that's the thing is what i love so much is that my reason like changes every day when I was younger, it was so singular. Uh, when I was in my band, I woke every, what I'll admit is I really loved being in that band because I woke up every morning. I lived with these guys. We all lived together. We did everything together. Um, I woke up every morning knowing what I was put on this earth to do. And it was to be the front man of this amazing band full of talented guys. And we did everything for the music. Like we. We were those kind of people, like we lived for our band. Everything we did, all of our jobs, it was all to fund our music and to do our shows and to write and to record and, you know, everything was for us. Um, it was so singular and focused. And I think that's not a bad thing at all. I think it was really great, but 
I think there are times when we kind of put a body on a slab and we're trying to run electricity through it, thinking I can, I can keep this alive when it's dead. And I think this clinging, this holding on to something that's gone is so dangerous. Um, we want something to keep living past its expiration, but we're not in control of when something's over. You know, death can come not just for us, but for anything. And we have to understand it's at any time in any way. And what makes us strong as people is surviving those losses. I, I, I've been through so much. Like I have experienced some really unique emotions. I, I, I feel, that's my opinion, maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like the things that I have had to go through and the pains in my heart and um, the lessons that I've learned, I don't feel like everyone has experienced those things. And the victories that I've felt, the good things, the beautiful things, the 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 rainbows that were kind of cocooned in suffering, you know, like there were so many things that I had to just kind of cut myself over and over to get to, you know, like I was crawling through the mud to attain this beauty in my life. And I want to find a way to get other people to feel those things or understand those things or see those things. And that's a big part of like my music. You know, somebody once told me that great pop music is taking the greatest failures of your heart and making it danceable. And I think, yeah. Cool. And I think that's what I try to do is um, I've had a lot of really painful things when it comes to heartbreak and when it comes to life in general. Um, and I found ways to make it survivable by making it danceable, by making it something that someone can listen to and be like, hey, this got to be, you know? Um, I love that juxtaposition of this is heartbreak on the dance, you know, this is suffering, but with kind of this like happy, you know, uh, but this is in C major, you know, <laughs> like suffering in C major. Um, and but not only that, but also like I've been learning how to write happier songs now that I am in a really wonderful relationship that's actually like good for me, you know, mentally and non-toxic. Uh, I'm able to write songs that are also about kind of the victories of love. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something I'm really grateful for as well, is uh, that I can I can share those feelings and what I've learned about that, you know, um, what I've learned is like to not be ashamed or not be scared of letting love be successful. I think um, a lot of people, like I've been told, you know, Jared, you have a bad picker, you know, like there's some sort of like internal thing inside of me leading towards these men that's just defective. You know, my intuition is off and it is leading me towards these paths of ruin. But what I've realized is that that's not really the case. It's just, I haven't learned everything about myself yet. I didn't know myself well enough to know. These are the things that I want that I don't need. These are the things that I want that I do need. These are the good things, these are the bad things. And I need to listen to the part of me that I know is giving me what's a good thing, instead of the part of me that's kind of hungry for all the wrong reasons, you know? Um, it's, it's funny because I see someone acting a certain way now and I can say, oh my God, like, I don't want anything to do with that. Like that person is not good for me. Um, when 10 years ago, I've been like, oh my God, I have to show this guy that I'm worthy, you know? Um, so it's, it's interesting, the lessons that you learn mm -hmm. and uh, that you can trust yourself. You just need to kind of wise up. So, and that sounds kind of like a contradiction, but it's like, it's still coming from me. Like, that's what's important is that like, I'm still listening to myself. I just know better, you know? Um, and I think that's the thing that's really important. So that's what I try to write about is kind of how to fine tune your intuition and then how to trust yourself. You know, I think that's a really hard thing for people to do when they failed, you know, um, is how do you, how do you trust yourself knowing, well, I listened to myself before and that was a road to ruin. So I'm not going to trust my heart anymore, but you can't do that because then you don't believe in anything that you're doing. Everything becomes so inauthentic and you're living someone else's life. You're following someone else's dreams. And you you don't want that. At the end of the day, you're gonna wake up every morning being like, I don't wanna be on the earth for this. You know, like this isn't this isn't why I'm here. Okay. Yes, we fail. Yes, there's really awful, miserable times that we have, but like um 
we survive it. And we have to continue being ourselves through all of it because being somebody else, that's a fate worse than death. You know, like that's a suicide that's worse than, worse than suicide because you keep going, you go on living, but you're not you. So you're just kind of this empty thing. So many people do that. And I think that's a fate worse than death. So I would just, I would love to include the links to your music and your, um, your podcast and anything else that you would like to share for people to check out in the description. Um, yeah. So you can, yeah. you, you can send me that information. I'll be sure to include it. Okay. Um, yeah. I, do you want me to, I can say it now. Um, sure, sure. So I'm on SoundCloud. If you want to go there, it's SoundCloud, just uh, soundcloud.com slash invot. I N V as in Victor O T. That is my name as a recording artist. Um, as for my podcast, it's subject. Uh, I think my latest episode is still yours, Katie. So everyone, if you like Katie, you will hear her story. Uh, subject, it's uh, spelt super weird. It is, um, look at K, hold on, it is S-U-B-J, S-U-B-J-E-K-T. That is how you spell it, subject podcasts on Spotify and everything. Um, so yeah, those two things are kind of my, my creative life right now. Um, oh, Katie, I am doing the craziest thing on illegal pigeon racing. That's going to be one of my next episodes. And it it's insane, I promise you. Like, people are kidnapping pigeons and all this other stuff. Oh, it is out of this world. So definitely, like, that's on, that's on its way out. So once, I hope that your listeners, I hope it's out by the time this comes out because it is an insane it's just, I, I, the more I learn about it, the more I'm just completely flabbergasted by illegal pigeon racing. Wow. It is one of the wildest things in the world. Anyway. So many things <laughs> in the world. <laughs> it's been so, so lovely to talk to you and to hear your story and just to see, you, see your hope. And that's a, that's a theme that's so important to me to share out there is listen to your intuition you can you can change your life you have the power to change and things can get better yes it can so i want to um end the conversation with giving you a hug air hugs Hi. you're my favorite Yay. katie i hope we can hang out again soon yes and hugs katie. to you watching this thank you for being here please leave a comment saying jared is awesome and um We'll, we'll see how many of those comments we would, we can count and that will be cool. If you enjoy getting to know overcoming, big-hearted, world-changing people, I hope you'll subscribe and stick around for more conversations and check out conversations I've already had. I also do vlogs on this channel and just show the real side of life and hope that we I hope we can connect over that as well. Thank you so much for being here. Hugs!